Hey everybody, welcome back. In this video about CT contrast agents, we'll be talking about general principles of the types and properties of CT contrast agents. First, let's understand why contrast is so important in CT imaging. These two images were acquired on the same patient. First, the patient's abdomen was scanned without contrast, as we see on the left, and then the patient was scanned again with contrast, as we see on the right. In the image to the left without contrast, we can see most of the major structures of the abdomen. In some cases, they're hard to differentiate from each other, and we really don't see anything unusual. However, when we scan this patient again with contrast on the right, we can see the tissues of the abdomen much more clearly. It's easier to differentiate between those tissues, and now we can see something very important in the liver. In the scan without contrast, the liver looks fine. But in the scan with contrast, now we can see a significant abnormality in the right lobe of the liver. This patient probably has hepatocellular carcinoma, in other words, a primary cancer of the liver. And this is why it's so important to use various forms of contrast in CT imaging. There's just some things that we see with contrast that we would never see without contrast. There's a few types of contrast that we use in CT. The first kind we'll talk about is water-soluble iodine. Iodine is usually very toxic to the human body, so for CT imaging, it's attached to a benzene ring. A benzene ring is an organic molecule that is not so easily rejected by the body, it's not as toxic to the body, and therefore attaching iodine to the benzene ring makes the body tolerate the iodine. Something else we should know about water-soluble iodine is because it is biologically bound and because it is water-soluble, it is safe for IV injection. Water-soluble iodine is the only kind of contrast agent that is safe for IV injection. There are different forms of water-soluble iodine. In other words, it can have different properties. For example, water-soluble iodine will be ionic or it will be non-ionic and water-soluble iodine will be considered high osmolar or low osmolar. So first let's talk about what it means to be ionic or non-ionic. Let's consider two separate pitchers of fluid. These two pitchers of fluid are identical in every way, but in the first pitcher of fluid we are going to place an ionic contrast agent. When we place an ionic contrast agent into this fluid, the ionic contrast agent will break apart. So the molecule, which originally was one molecule, now has broken apart into multiple molecules. In addition to breaking apart, these individual particles also become charged. And this is the idea of an ionic contrast agent. An ionic contrast agent, when it is placed into a solution or a fluid like blood, it breaks apart and forms individual particles called ions. These ions are charged, and so this kind of contrast agent would be called an ionic contrast agent. This is not desirable. The preferred kind of contrast agent would be a non-ionic contrast agent. This kind of contrast agent, when it's placed into a solution or fluid like human blood, nothing happens. The molecule remains in one piece, it does not break apart, and there are no charged particles. So let's make sure we understand the main facts of an ionic contrast agent. An ionic contrast agent, by definition, forms charged particles in fluid, including in human blood. Because of this, Ionic contrast agents have a higher toxicity, they're more damaging to the body. And because of this ionicity, they also have higher osmolarity. So let's talk about osmolarity. Once again, we'll consider two pitchers of fluid. This time, we'll look at human blood and compare it to our typical IV injectable contrast agent. Osmolarity refers to the concentration of particles in a fluid. Blood has a certain concentration of particles measured as the osmolarity, and contrast agents also have a different osmolarity, which also measures the concentration of those particles. These particles are not necessarily charged or uncharged, but osmolarity refers to the concentration of those particles. In the image that you're seeing now, there's the same number of particles in contrast compared to the number of particles in blood. And this is what we would want, but normally contrast has significantly more particles than blood. In other words, we would say it has a higher osmolarity. 
Blood has an osmolarity of about 300 milliosmoles per liter. Most contrast agents have a osmolarity which is significantly greater than 300 milliosmoles per liter. Our goal is to have a contrast agent that is as close to the osmolarity of blood as possible. So here's the main facts that we need to understand. The only IV injectable contrast agent is water-soluble iodine. In the perfect situation, this water-soluble iodine should be non-ionic, which means it does not break apart into charged particles. Additionally, our preference is to use low osmolarity contrast agents, which would mean that the concentration of contrast should be very similar to the concentration of blood. Here's a few examples of different kinds of IV injectable contrast agents. All of these contrast agents are water soluble, but you can see that they have different levels of iodine concentration. Some of them are ionic, some of them are non-ionic, some of them have a very high osmolarity, and some have an osmolarity that is very close to that of blood. Let's look at Visipaik as an example. Visipaik is non-ionic. You'll also know that this particular example is called Visipaik 320. Sometimes this number 320 is mistakenly referred to as the osmolarity, which is not correct. 320 refers to the concentration of iodine in the solution, but not to the overall osmolarity. Visipaik 320 has a very low osmolarity of 290, which is almost identical to the osmolarity of blood. Therefore, Visipaik, because it is non-ionic and because it has a low osmolarity, has a very low toxicity to the body. Besides iodine, there is another type of contrast that's sometimes used in CT, and that is barium sulfate. Barium sulfate is completely different from water-soluble iodine in several ways. For example, barium sulfate is not water-soluble. Because it's not water-soluble, it is not safe for IV injection. Barium sulfate is only used in the GI tract. Sometimes the patient is given barium sulfate orally. We might give the patient barium sulfate rectally, but we would never use barium sulfate for IV injection. It is not water-soluble. Also, we should understand that barium sulfate used for CT is significantly less concentrated than barium sulfate used for fluoroscopic imaging. They are not interchangeable. Barium sulfate for CT imaging has a concentration between 1% and 2%. Here's an example of what can go wrong. The patient in the image to the left was scanned shortly after receiving a fluoroscopy procedure. That fluoroscopy procedure used 40% barium. That barium was so dense that it caused significant artifact in the image. This particular kind of artifact is what we call beam hardening. That's the appearance of streaking throughout the image. Compare this to the image to the right. This patient also has barium in the colon, but this patient received the appropriate 2% barium prescribed for CT imaging. We can still see the contrast in the bowels, but it's not so dense that it causes artifact in the images. So that's an overview of the different types and properties of CT contrast agents.